live live stream. Stream. Hello, world. My name is Jerry Fielka. It's January 24, 2021, and it's an honor and a pleasure to be here with Clinton Ignatoff and Sherry Tatum. Hello, great <laughs> people. We are going to try to put what we learned from James Joyce and Finnegan's Wake Marshall McLuhan, Carl Jung, William Blake, into layperson's terms and not talk in intellectual academic mumbo jumbo. But I am um, wanting to start. I was at a wake service today and I learned two words. And those words were be kind. And I was like, that's what these two people I'm going to spend some time with this evening are. They've both <laughs> been kind to me sharing their insights. So I just wanted to start with a, a big hug of, of gratitude to both of you because I'm just a student and I'm just learning. And uh, boy, did I, have I learned a lot from both of you. <laughs> so- um, Thanks, Jerry. Thank you, I'm, I'm, I'm sincere. So we'll start off with a real simple one. And that is, um, Sherry, you've, uh, brought up William Blake often in our Finnegan's Wake reading clubs. And I'm always intrigued by his saying, we become what we behold. Now that sounds sort of simple, but what does it really mean to you? What is that, you know, and just how does that make you feel? We become what we behold. Um, I, I would say that it's, it's like what we um, what we're brought up with as children uh, that um, th like what we're exposed to at an early age, and then uh, and then that becomes part of our souls. Um, That's good. Let's you know, go to. If we are brought up with kindness, then then we're going to become kindness. Yeah. That's good. So, Clinton, what does that mean to you? We become what we behold. Yeah. The, um, as Sherry said, we, we, we're, we're basically reflecting um, the world. I, I could also think of it sort, sort of akin to that old, uh, that old joke, you know, if you make a silly face, it gets stuck that way. <laughs> In the same regard. <laughs> but uh yeah yeah we we t we tend to close around or, or uh or get used to and Im embody the things that that that, would, that we um focus on for a long time maybe you want to put it that way yeah so that was yeah. that was really good and it was amazing because McLuhan learned from Emerson and Thoreau that the things we invent extend our humanness so we invented three types of communication, basically, spoken word, printed word, and electronic word. And this, these things extended some humanness in us. That sounds, mm -hmm. you know, sort of what I get from we become what we behold, because Mark Twain said, if I have a hammer in my hand, everything looks like a nail, you know? So, you know, if I have a pencil, a pen in my hand, I've got to use it and take notes. And if I'm in a Zoom session, I have to sit there and look at other people's eyes and talk and listen. <laughs> we can't just sit here for 90 minutes and stare at each other's eyes. That would be fun. <laughs> but that doesn't happen. You don't see Zooms where people don't talk. So Sounds very tranquil. I, yeah, it's very <laughs> tranquil. I was... The beauty of the difference in uh, the Venice, um, the Venice Finnegan's Wake Reading Club is, I can't I can't really stand quiet in people thinking. I have to keep people talking. In Austin, sometimes there's these gaps where there's no one talking, and it's like, wow, thank God, <laughs> a breath. You know? I love those parts where we're. 
we're all just staring at the page and nobody's saying anything. It's like you can hear everybody thinking. And I, I love that. That shows that we're not just, just saying stuff just to say stuff. We're, we want to be sure that we're, you know, bringing, bringing something. Right. And it is fun because, um, Sherry, one of my honored moments in the Austin wake is after attending for several months now, it seems like almost a year, a quarter of a year, uh, I constantly saying my mantras, there's no content in the wake. In about <laughs> two or three months into it, you said, Jerry, are you going to tell us there's no content? <laughs> <laughs> and I love that moment because, you know, these people are so intelligent and so down to earth at the same time that, you know, having run a Finnegan's Wake reading club for 25 years, I'm just like a baby in a new, you know, playpen, just really learning how to, you know, become what I behold. Well, I, uh, what I, I said this to a friend of mine, I said, it, uh, the Venice group, like we might read something and, and um, on the page. And then a couple of people will say, Hmm, this seems to refer to the Egyptian book of the dead. I wonder how Joyce knew about that. Oh, well, perhaps he learned about it from the Jesuits. And in the Austin group, we're like, Wow, this is from the Egyptian Book of the Dead. That's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> and so it, it really brings up this, yeah, this thing I, I love is um, it's called user as content. It's what McLuhan updated mid career. He took his most famous aphorism, medium is the massage, medium is the message, and changed it and rebooted it and says, no, I'm going to update it to the user as the content. So I think one thing we could um, really delve into with your insights from both of you is this idea I really learned from Frank Zappa, and that's called embrace contradictions. So you have yin and yang. You have dualities. You have polarities. You have fall and you rise. You have light and you have dark. You have happy and you have sad. So that's the great James Joyce word, laugh tears. You laugh and you cry. That's the human condition. And then you have form and you have content. You know, the form of this Zoom is our heads are looking at each other and we're talking. The content is what's coming out of our mouths. So how would you, Sherry, we'll start with you. How would you talk about the difference between sign and symbol? You know, are they like that duality? And, and how do you define them? And how do you navigate those two things in your knowledge of Jung and whatever? Yeah, well, I know Jung uh, talks about how you know, symbol and image is important because there are a lot of things that you can't say in words that they don't like. Say you have a dream, you can't really explain it in words, but then there might be like you might see a mandala or, or like some maybe a religious painting or something that's very symbolic that kind of captures or resonates with with the dream, but it doesn't express it in words. And so that's, I, I think, I know for me, symbol and image has always been important, even before I, before I even knew who Carl Jung was my whole life, it's, it's been more symbol and image than, I don't know what you mean exactly by sign, do you mean word? Or? Well, yeah, that's, you, you put it into the context you want. What do you think the word sign means? You know, because there's there's something different between symbol and sign. And just in your own intuitive way, what would you say the difference is? Because you're saying symbol is more image oriented. So you're saying it's more eye oriented? Um, well, you would see it with your eye, but it's not just seeing it with your eye. It's, it's like you, like I, you know, if I see a painting by... Uh, 
I think his name is Fra Angelica. He did a lot of paintings of the Virgin and Child and the Annunciation and all of that. And when I see those, there's a lot of gold and um, the angels always holding lilies. And and um, it, even if I don't know what the signs mean, I might not know this what it means to hold to hold a lily. Like what is the symbolism of a lily? But I. I, it, it resonates with me in some way. Right. And so what do you think a sign is? What What is a sign as opposed to a symbol? Just in your own words, you know, what what's your intuition say? Yeah, I, is it, I guess when you say, if you said, um, show me a sign, I would point to a stop sign. <laughs> Just something yeah. that's uh, meant to communicate a basic thing. Yes. No, that's good. So, Clint, what do you think? What's the difference between symbol and sign? Well, now that I'm thinking about it, um, I think that a meaning of a symbol could 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 change for me over time. A, a, I could look at a symbol or, or maybe hear a symbol uh, again, um, and then a little while later, and, and it would mean something different. I would see something else into it. Whereas I would assume that a sign sort of uh, has a, a much more fixed, uh, it whatever it expresses or points to, it, it, it it's much more fixed and uh, static. And... So you mean a sign is not changing and a symbol is changing? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Because, see, the word sign came up first in etymology in 13th century. It, it meant a gesture, a, a motion of the hand, an ID mark, an identification. But it, it's based on this word meaning to cut. That's where the word came from, etymologically. The word hmm. symbol came from... Years later, 15th century, and it means a creed or a summary or a religious belief. And it's sort of like a token or a mark to throw things together. Mm -hmm. So, you know, does that, you know, evoke anything for you? Go ahead, Clinton, and then Sherry. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, well, I mean, you, I think you could throw together a whole bunch of signs and make them into a symbol, but but not vice versa. Um, uh, a, a symbol's more complex. Um, uh, and again, when I went, it could just as well be talking about musical symbols insofar as how they <laughs> resonate when you crash them together. So, so I'm sure that there, there's there's got to be a common meaning there. Um, Whereas a sign, it's 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 almost pretty boring because I th I think of what whatever um you know the field of it's called se semiotics where where it's only like a hundred years old or where where people talk about signs pointing to this refers to that right it's a it's it, it's just very um two dimensional and uh, and basic in that regard. So yeah, so Sherry, what does that? Uh the word symbol evoke in your studies of young, you know, what does he say about symbols? Yeah, it's, it's a means into something deeper. Um, you know, you can use a, a symbol to get into a meditation or you can look at a mandala and um, it, it'll take you deeper into something instead of, and, and like I, I like what Clinton was saying about the, like the sign. I know there's a friend of mine is, uh, she said she was going to order a book for me. It's by that guy, Roland Bar Barthes, B-A-R-T-H-E-S. Yeah. And, yeah. and um, so I've been looking forward to reading that because that's, he goes into that, doesn't he? I, I don't know that much about it, but I've always heard of him. But um, He's definitely important. I have not studied him yet a lot, but I know people love him, but, but it's fun because Clinton um, reminded me of the great uh, line, words evoke more than their meaning. So we could say symbol 
is like a, a crashing, you know, steel thing you use with your drum set. But I'm trying to get to this thing, the difference between Jung and McLuhan on the likenesses, because McLuhan started to read Jung in the 30s. I mean, mm -hmm. well, let's just start with you, uh, Sherry. When did you get into Jung and why? Um, well, like I say, I had always uh, paid attention to things like my dreams and and um, uh, I. Well, my mother's Irish, so and she, you know, we we grew up in in Texas, though. <laughs> but uh, she used to she would talk about the fairies like just nonchalantly, like of course there's fairies, you know, it was no question with her and my sister and I used to just sit in this big fig tree in, in our backyard in Houston and, and there were fairies there, you know, didn't question that. So so I always felt like I was kind of in that other world all the time <laughs> anyway. And then when I first started hearing about Carl Jung, I was like, oh, okay, this is, I, I can, you know, it, it, it just really resonated with me. And then, uh, um, a few years ago, um, I started going to events at the Carl Jung Center in, in Austin, lectures and things. And then I volunteered to work in the library. And then they asked me if I would be the librarian. And I was like, yes. <laughs> so, so I had a physical space. I was the librarian uh, for about three years now. Lately, we've lost our space where we had all the books and everything. So um, I don't know if I could still call myself the librarian, but <laughs> right. of the young society. But that was heaven to me to get to just go and sit in there and be surrounded by all the young books. <laughs> right. But it's like, what is it about Jung that is he explaining dreams or he, is he is he trying to say there's a pathway I can lead you to knowing there's something deeper in dreams? And how does that work? I mean, it's just simply pay attention to your dreams. What is Jung saying? Well, like uh, people say, oh, I, I don't ever remember my dreams. But, you know, if you if you consciously try to remember your dreams, then it's it's like a communication between, you know, your waking life and your psyche. And, and so your psyche is like, oh, she's paying attention to this. So then it's, it's easier to remember your dreams if you're, you know, it's like you're communicating with, with your psyche when you're doing that. And, um, and then you can, like, like my book that I'm writing, um, I had watched a documentary about Jonestown. And, um, you know, not one of the cheesy ones, but a good one on PBS. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, and then that night I had like a momentous dream that involved my friend who died at Jonestown, um, someone else close to me who died that was with him in the dream. And, um, and he was, uh, we were teenagers when we knew each other, but he's my friend who died at Jonestown. And, um, and then when I woke up in the morning, I was like, well, I have to write about this, this, you know, so it was like, I was listening to my dream. But how did Jung studies cause you to say, I have to write about it. So he, he's teaching you that there's something in your dreams to pay attention to, but something for you it was like you had to get that out of your system or out of your psyche and put it on paper. Like talk about the process of going from what's inside your psyche to paper. Why, why were you inclined to do that? Paper and pencil. Well, Jung talks about um, how, you know, um, God, God needs man to witness the universe. Like human beings are the witnesses of the universe. And he 
he needs us just as much as we need him. Like he talks about participating in the archetypal psyche by by um, by our human experiences and and what um, when we process them and give meaning to them. I mean, you know, you could look at the world and say there's no meaning to life. You know, it's just all this crazy stuff going on and there's no meaning to it. It's just a bunch of molecules bumping up against each other. But if when we give meaning to it, which do we do by story and all of that, then then we are participating in the creation of the universe with God. We're, we're like, um, he, he wants us to be witnessing what's going on. And, and we do that through storytelling, through music, through um, art. Yeah. Well, that was good because I learned um, that um, American Indians go from tent to tent in the morning after they sleep and they go up to their fellow Indians and they go, what did you dream last night? And then the Indian tries to explain in words what they dreamt, which is sort of like crazy, but we think we can sort of evoke what happened in our dreams with words. And so they would say that the person asking the question was the co-creator of the dream. So it wasn't just the dreamer telling the dream, it was the person asking the question. And I said, well, that's what Finnegan's Wake is. We're co-creators of the reading Finnegan's Wake out loud with a group of people. We're co-creators of this living organism. It's not just Joyce. We're co-creators. So that's why God needs man to witness the universe. You know, Joyce needs the reader to witness the wake. So uh, Clinton, any uh, comments on what just came up? I've always thought that... Um... When you're trying to put a dream into words, I'm not sure. I can't say I always thought, but um, I think I I heard somewhere that uh, in psychoanalysis, I'm not sure if, if it was Jung specifically, that uh, when you're trying to put the dream into words, the parts that you think are important enough to put into words must have special meaning for you. So the the dream has meaning, but also your telling of the dream and what it is you include in your account and and then also what it is you you don't include in the account is is like a retelling is a re-experience of the dream which the things you thought relevant to mention must mean more to you because you mentioned that but of course there's always so many things happening in a dream that you can't uh like like you were saying you, you can't get it all get it all out there i i, I tend to you know at least when, know. once or twice a month i'll i'll have a dream that's i'll wake up from go holy crow i have to write that down and i'll sit down and you know it'll only be the tail end of it <laughs> and it'll only be you know a few things and, and then maybe a month or two months later i, I read it and, and i forget all the things that i didn't write down right so so now what, what the dream is what is what i i was able to record in my journal right so so th th that sort of two-step process i always thought was 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 interesting yeah well that's back to sherry sherry do you think your mom telling you fairy tales let's say developed your sense with your sister of how to tell these to each other or share tales i mean can you get better at recalling your dreams because you read or you sing songs or you write poetry or it is there an accuracy thing involved? Like, are you more, uh, you know, capable of recalling your dreams in words than other people? Is Young talk about that, or how how do you process that idea? Yeah, I well, I I, I think Clinton's right. In um, Young did that if, if like a patient would tell him about a dream, he, he knew it was like, it's, it's that person's individual recalling of it and that person's, uh, what they think is most important is, is what it's, um, 
what the message is is it's because we each have our own there's like well there's the archetypal psyche you know the archetypes but then there's also like each person has their own symbols that uh, are important to them and they might um you know something could could represent something to clinton but it would be his own personal symbol that like he could say a word that would mean something to another person but it means something completely different to him and it's his personal symbolism there and yeah, so I feel that's like what ties it, sorry so i was just gonna say that's got to tie back a lot with the wake uh, a lot as well <laughs> insofar as what 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 you're saying there eh? Yeah. Well, the wake is very open to interpretation and that's the beauty of it. As much as it can be studied by many books and scholars saying this is what it might mean, it's still, like I would say, more widely available to mean many things to many people. Like I always think it's ridiculous when someone comes into our group with the Here's the Italian translation of the way, or here's a French translation. I say, you can't translate the wake. And then in China, a couple of years ago, it was a bestseller. Now, I'm not saying you can, I'm saying it has 60, over 60 languages in it. So, how could you ever translate it? Well, you can, but you, you know, it's a little difficult. So, that's just a metaphor for anyone reading the wake. It can mean many things, but there is something going on that's really deep. And, you know, Joyce did have intentions and aspirations, and it is like a roadmap. But I would like, Sherry, tell us what do you mean by the words archetype and what do you mean by psyche? So you use psyche and you said soul, but put it in, um, you know, suss those two words out. What do they mean? What does psyche mean? Yeah. Um, well, let's see that. Well, the word comes from, um, psyche from, from Greek mythology. Um, she was, uh, a girl <laughs> that, uh, uh, and Cupid fell in love with her, Eros fell in love with her, and um, so I guess they used her, the story of, of Eros and Psyche, they used that, because, let's see, I'm trying to remember, she, um, she had to wander the earth, um, I don't remember, but... Uh, Let's see. Yeah, it, it means soul or spirit. So it's a part of ourselves that's that's our our soul. So you mean it's like a non-verbal part of ourselves? Is it non is it non-physical? That's what I mean. Is it non-physical? Yeah, I mean young um he was, his father was like a Lutheran minister. So he was brought up hmm. in, in a very religious background, but he himself, um, I, it's always kind of hard to tell with Jung if he, he's not, he's very, he's not traditional. He's not traditionally religious. He, he does talk about the soul, but I don't know if he, um, believes it's it's more like he was seeing it as as like a part of the personality i mean what do you do you know anything about this clinton like do, do you think was young traditionally religious did he believe in an afterlife and all that or mm -hmm. um, uh, i read a good portion of of the red book that's my most oh, recent wow. oh, going back and looking at Jung. It's just extremely symbolic, right? It's it it is like one giant dream that 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 you have to interpret as, yeah. uh, uh, as you know, he travels sort of in, into the 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 
darker half of his soul and and meets the characters inside of him and 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 whatnot and they all rep they all of course and we have to use the word we they, they all have they're all the archetypes that that he meets sort of inside of himself and uh, different characters can be two halves of the same character and, and all sorts of other wonderful dream logic but uh it's actually very heavy and um and uh and uh yeah no young was a dude oh, dude <laughs> Pardon my my informal language here. It's it's all Jerry's fault. <laughs> Young was a dude who uh, re- actually I also watched Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure last night with a friend. That also got the to do. <laughs> <laughs> Young was a real heavy dude, man. Um, but he he he, uh, he definitely uh, was well. G- g- goodness gracious it's it's world war one right and and i i only imagine that you know the the world is the world is falling apart and tearing apart and he's going on this meaning quest sort of tearing himself apart like it's it's very serious serious and of course yes there is christianity in it and 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 jesus is in it and 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 but uh it's 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 all very um blood red drenched sort of uh sort of um i mean i'm sure that's probably why it's called the red book right so it's very heavy he's grappling with with these these questions although i i I hesitate to know that i could formulate or formulate in words or um that i know well well enough to say whether he was religious he dealt with religion he 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 spoke in religion he he it it ran through him at at least yeah yeah Sherry, the the great thing, hold on one second. The great thing is that you passed it to, to Clinton. <laughs> that was beautiful because you must you must both have ESP because I wrote in my, my notes here, Jung, 1930 to well, 1913 to 1930, 17 years, he wrote his nocturnal work, which is called the Red Book. From 1922 to 1939, Joyce wrote his book of the night, 17 years. So there's really an amazing parallel. But um, go ahead what you were going to say, Sherry. But uh, again, I wanted to put it back in Clinton's court after that about what is the psyche and what is the soul. So go ahead, Sherry. Well, the... Um, I love that you mentioned World War One. I, I have I've always had like this um, strong feeling about World War One, like the sorrow and the pity of it all. Almost, I I think sometimes I think I in a former life that I died in World War One because it's always had. Whenever I've heard, I remember a teacher read us um, in Flanders Fields when I was in third grade, and it just it felt like. It felt like I was remembering it. It wasn't like I was hearing a poem. I was remembering the battlefields, like all the details of the battlefields. But um, yeah, Jung was on a train in the Alps uh, in 1913, and he had a vision of Europe under blood. He saw it, you know, he was up in the mountains and he saw Europe under blood. And then that's when he went to his country house and started working on the red books. He was in a, such a deep depression and that's what he sort of had to do. And that's when he started exploring Eastern um, philosophy and all that. And, and I, you know, it's, Jung is very hard to read. I mostly read uh, things by Edward Edinger. This is the anatomy of the psyche, which I'm, if anybody ever wants hmm. to study book with me. I'm doing it with a friend now, but we also did it at the at the Young Society at the library. We studied this book. It's great. But um, it's it's hard to tell if he um, like what he he uses all these terms like soul and he's he's a mystic for sure. But you know it's hard to tell like what he really thought would be is there an afterlife is you know all that well it sounds like sherry you were tapping into like past life thing you were tuning in like a radio broadcast to some past life of yours in in reading that 
you know, and that's sort of what reminds me of collective consciousness. But I did want Clinton to just say what you think psyche and soul is and then put out what Sherry thinks Young meant by archetype, and then Clinton, you can say what Marshall meant by archetype, and we can just sort of, you know, navigate through that. But first, Clinton, what do you? How do you define the psyche or the soul? I mean, what is that? Yeah, um, yeah. It's, it seems like it would be really simple to say it's the. It's the subconscious. It's, it's, uh, um, right, right. Uh, obviously, I, I think it was Aristotle, Aristotle probably flushed it out in with, with on the soul, right? Um, but, uh, when, when I think of Carl Jung and the psyche as this place, which I, I have to lead into the next question, um, within which there, there are these archetypal patterns, which, which, which end up, um, we end up projecting and finding in the real world that they, uh, right. Young things that we're pulling out of ourselves, this, this, uh, these, these archetypal patterns, um, um, that we have i believe that we're born with and then and then in the world we we encounter representations of them everywhere because we, we sort of sense them um sense them to begin with be, be because we uh, see them coming so to speak uh, all right so 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 the psyche is 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 you know the more the, the larger part of our mind than just our our ego i i i suppose um i'm, That's I'm good. feeling that way anyway no, that was good. More part of our mind than just our ego, because I want to talk about ego, too. But Sherry, what is archetype? What does Jung mean by archetype? Like he said patterns, that helped me a little, but I still, you know, we're leading to this thing where, what you know, Marshall wrote a book from cliche to archetype. And, you know, it plays a big part in his studies you know, st starting reading Jung in the 30s. But I know you know Jung enough to, like, what does he really mean by archetype? I think it's based on the, like, uh, platonic idea of the ideals, the platonic ideals that there's, like, you know, um, you know, like, like I guess ideals like, like justice, um, you know, all these, these big concepts that are like Plato would say they're innate in our, as humans, we just have those ideals innate in us. And, and Jung says that too. And, and the archetypes are, um, like the shadow, the anima, the animas, the, um, the wise old man, the, um, the lover, the warrior, uh, those are all archetypes, and and he says they're they're universal because, in like if you study uh, mythology around the world, we all have every culture has the same archetypes, even though those cultures might never have communicated with each other thousands of years ago. But but they would have the myths all have the same archetypes in them. And the, the hero's journey and all that. Um, that was so really that. well. Put. Yeah. But let me just ask you a question before we go to Clinton. And he, he can explain what he thinks McLuhan thought by archetype or, or you know, el elucidate on that. But our, Sherry, mm -hmm. are archetypes morals and ethics? Is that is that what an archetype is? Because some of those things you were saying seem as though they're like i'm always curious about hate because i think is hate innate in humans to hate things or is it culturally learned and we talk about this a lot in our group and i'm always intrigued by it because you could easily say well hate is survival of the fittest if someone's stealing your food or killing your family you might hate them because you want to survive but, you know, it seems as though hating could go into that ethics and morals sort of category. Is archetypes sort of ethics and morals? 
Well, in the like it, in Jung, when he talks about the development of the of the ego and and what he calls the individuation process, which is you're really working on developing the self as a whole throughout your life, and the and so the ego is a, is a, the ego is kind of the organizing principle of the self, but the ego can become inflated, and say say you're like somebody does something that you hate them for, you become enraged. Um, then you be, Jung says you become possessed by the, by the, because when you're born, you, you know, a baby or a child thinks that they're God, you know, like the whole world revolves around me. I'm God. Everybody, you know, everybody's here to meet my needs. And, and if you're not, like if somebody doesn't meet your needs, you're going to have a temper tantrum. You're going to, um, how dare you not let me have what I want because I'm God. You know, you, I mean, you don't have that concept, but that's the way you feel. So you're possessed by, he calls it possessed by a deity when you're in that hateful state. And of course, you know, adults can do that. Too. Um, so, so like all of the, every, every world culture that has mythology, every myth, is a cautionary tale about not getting carried away about like what happens to people who get carried away by by those states uh, of kind of immature emotions like um you know the um what is it who was it phaeton who was allowed to drive the chariot of the sun across the sky but he ends up dying because he he drives it too fast. He's too young. He doesn't know what he's doing. So every every story in mythology is a cautionary tale about not getting carried away by those primitive emotions by by hate. Mm -hmm. That was really, that was really good, Sherry, because you did what we try to do on McLuhan Mashup is put it in layperson's term. It wasn't highbrow. I could understand that, but I'm gonna before I go to Clinton on that. Is ethics and morals sort of like archetype? Is that similar or different? Oh, are you asking Clinton? Or yeah, yeah. No, I'm asking you, Sherry, first. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Is is archetypes different from morals? Um, well, let's see. We're born with the, according to Plato and, and Jung, we're born, the, the archetypes are innate within us. Um, uh, I, I don't know. Um, I don't know if they're morals or, uh, I kind of tend to, yeah, I'll, I'll have to think about that. I'm not sure. No, that's good. But let's do one more. If if I asked you, is hating innate or is it more innate or is it more invented? Is it in us innately or is it culturally learned or invented by humans? Hating. I I think it's I think it's in us. You know, we innately. Innately. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, Clinton, what is the heck Marshall using the word archetype for? Why? You know, you got you know what I'm asking. So go ahead. How is it different? From yeah, the yeah, from the McClellan, yeah, McLuhan had the gall to go and take everyone else's theory and then work it into his own and and and, <laughs> uh, and whatnot, right? So, so he would he saw archetypes as something uh, which uh, which. Uh, were conceptualized because literature exists. So because there were books and novels and, and because there are, you know, um, written down um, mythologies, uh, uh, he saw archetypes themselves as you could say being like environmental or put into us pr programmed by hearing stories. Uh, right. right. Um, uh, so when he said, when he was talking about archetypes, he wasn't talking about literary archetypes or Jungian archetypes per se. He he 
he, he was using it to describe media and environments, actually. And uh, he was sort of looking at, excuse me, a total scene. Um, uh, a whole pile of cliches, so, sort of like at the beginning when we said that, you know, a whole bunch of signs might come together to make a symbol. Um, a whole bunch of cliches could come together to, to form a total archetypal environment. So, 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 so his, his idea of, of, of archetypes was, I've, I've been flipping through his, his book again, uh, on the subject, um, the archetype, excuse me, again, the, uh, the archetype is a retrieved awareness or consciousness it is consequently a retrieved cliche, um, an archetype is a quoted extension, medium technology or environment. So, so the idea that when you're in an environment, there's a, it, it gives you a whole set of awareness. There's the things that you are to focus on and the things that you are to, uh, to ignore, right? Like if you're staring at a giant, um, if you go to the UN, you're going to see a whole bunch of flags and every flag is a cliche. And then the idea of there being all these nations coming together is an archetype, some, something like this. That was good. And isn't it funny, though, uh, Sherry, that doesn't that sound like Jung, that archetype is consciousness and awareness? I mean, it doesn't seem he really messed with it. What do you think, Sherry? Uh, yeah, I, I read a little bit of, of that article that you sent. Um, yeah. That uh, Marcin co-wrote about. Uh, and I, so I was, I was thinking about that, just that term cliche that McLuhan thought of an archetype as a cliche. So he was thinking of it as kind of, so, so it's like, how do we get the cliche? Is it through, because we used to have like spoken language, you know, we would tell stories around the campfire. And so everything we heard was spoken and then it got into the written word um so what it i mean i just don't know that much about McLuhan, but but is it um i mean i know like the medium is mm -hmm. the, i know i read one of his books when i was a teenager but uh but um but i mean just the word awareness is really what jung appears to me to be saying we can raise our awareness and I think that's one of Marshall's main things is that we can literally raise our awareness. Now, my big thing is, is isn't everybody equally aware? You know, just because we can sit and talk about this, does that mean we're more aware than the normal wino on the street or the intellectual in the academic building? You know, I feel that everyone is equally aware. Say it again. Oh, I, I, I think there was just a echo there. Yeah. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Uh, Sherry, Sherry, what were you going to say? Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah. Everybody's equally aware. Yeah. Yeah. So then what these guys are just saying, well, we can raise our awareness. So can you really raise your awareness or is you just always aware? Um, yeah, I, I think, um, I guess to me, when I think of raising my awareness, then I think of of shaping it in a way that that it get maybe can um, give meaning to things, or see a story in things, or uh, and then not not get pulled into a sense of meaningless and meaninglessness and despair. Um, no, that was really good, Sherry, because that's what T.S. Eliot said, that I had the experience but missed the meaning. So some people, we might all have equal awareness levels, but some of us have experiences and don't get any meaning out of it. That's why one of my questions in my uh, interview series is, uh, do you more pursue meaning or more pursue happiness? You know, and, and I got it from Viktor Frankl, who says, you know, man's search for meaning. He says, meaning lasts, happiness doesn't. It's, of course, we're all seeking happiness, but 
are we really all seeking meaning? And then maybe meaning just bogs you down. And you're like, oh my God. But you're saying, no, it can help you avoid despair or avoid sadness, you know? So, I mean, I, I would like, Sherry, if you could comment on this word ego, which is, you know, this is a, a line that, um, that I've, I've learned from, I'm lucky because every Sunday I listen to Alan Watts for 30 minutes on the radio. And I mean, this is, this is like part of my religion. And he's, he always, everything I'm thinking about, he just touches on it so beautifully. And he's such a comedian and such an entertainer, you know, and he said, you know, everybody's trying to figure out who they are. And if you figure out who you are, you're really in trouble because you're in <laughs> flux. But but everybody wants to think, you know, we know who we are and have identity. And, you know, Marshall said that all forms of violence are a quest for identity. So, you know, that's an interesting thing. Why does humans have violence? Because they're trying to figure out who they are. So what do you... What do you think young men by ego in identity? I mean, it's really basic, but I mean, in your own words, how would you explain it? Mm. Well, um, yeah, the ego and identity. Well, I know I, I, this is what I was saying a few minutes ago. Like, like he saw the, the ego is like the organizing principle of the, personality and um, I don't know about identity. I mean, he talked about the self a lot. He talked about the individuation process and that throughout our lives we're, we're working on, on, you know, on the wholeness of the self. And, and so we're, we're constantly, he, he described like, like we're walking up this spiral staircase and we might, sometimes we think we've got something figured out, like, like we might, come up against some difficulty in life and then we we deal with it and we think we've got that figured out and then and then we're, we're walking up the next part of the spiral staircase and we meet the same thing again we're like oh I already did I thought I already dealt with that and then you're so you're you're, you're going through all those things over and over again that's so what I always say like like every time I think I'm enlightened then then there'll be this thing that comes along that's like ah <laughs> You think you're so enlightened. Well, here, deal with this. <laughs> you know, in, in, in Buddhism, uh, they talk about something like the bone that gets stuck in your throat. You can't swallow it and you can't spit it out. And sometimes it seems like you go through long periods of time like that where, like, what I can't, you know, there'll be like the one thing that just will just get you. Um well, I love that because I think that is that is the human condition is that you rise and fall and you should you everything you know is wrong as far as theater says, you know, and we should unlearn. So that's sort of our, our aspiration in McLuhan mashup is to unlearn all this stuff we think we've learned. And so we can, you know, go backwards. We live life walking forward. But in order to understand it, you got to go backwards. But that was very interesting because that seems egoistic if you're like, oh, I'm confident because I learned something and I know it. And now I can identify I am no, I am this person or I am this personality and I know this. But Clinton, what do you, you know, in what you brought up was very interesting, um, Sherry, too, just to backtrack, that it's funny that McLuhan converted to Catholicism when you brought oh. up God. But, um, uh, Lynn, how would you define what ego is, what identity is, and that whole thing that Marshall said, that violence is a quest for identity? That sounds, you know, sort of... Um, uh, twisty, turny McLuhanism, but it is interesting. What's your take on that? Um, before I, I'd like not to have this thought slip my mind. When you mentioned um, turning up a spiral staircase, it uh, 
It reminded me of a poem by T.S. Eliot called Ash Wednesday. And I, I only read it just two days ago because I was reading some literary criticism there regarding it. And the poem begins, um, because I do not hope to turn again, because I do not hope, because I do not hope to turn. And the structure of the poem is built around um, the speaker um, sort of going up a staircase, actually, and encountering sort of different stages. Um, and, uh, and the word tropology, or a trope, is a turning, or uh, that's what the word means. So, so it's sort of, sort of like when you in, in, encounter a trope, it, it, uh, it trans, it, it personally transforms you, or it transforms your identity. So, so, so just the, this poem it, itself is this idea of, of of elevating and going up a staircase, but also turning and being changed with each re revolution and not knowing what you'll find around the corner, and 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 and, and losing what you lose sight of behind you and. Uh, so so I just, I just thought that it was just uncanny that 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 you mentioned ascending a spiral staircase that was just poignant yeah. and had just been on my mind. Um, yeah, I, I, identity is is this um, process of changing, um, and uh, because again, McLuhan wanted to um, base people's identity and people's perception and people's psyche on their experience with the material world. Um, the human fashioned material world and especially the the media so so he saw um he saw the alphabet and the written word as creating stable identities egos that that you know they, they would change but you were the same person your entire more or or less you you had a fixed identity that would slowly change and grow and and, and mature throughout your life because you were fixed in in the rigid visual forms uh, or you know the logic of of uh of uh of um the sort of rational thinking that that logic gives to you but then but then jerry um um brought to, to point the the idea that uh, violence is um the quest for identity uh, right uh McLuhan would in other words he he would say that uh war is the biggest teacher or the biggest education right um um because you basically have to change everything about yourself in order for a, a life or death sort of you know struggle um and it's uh, it's a uh, it uh who you are you're gonna do things that you you of course um you know would would never have done if we think of a, Generally, someone's ego or, or someone's development, we think of it as taking place during, you know, peacetime, right? The exceptions are traumatic. The, 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 the exceptions of, 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 say, again, if we can go back to Carl Jung, thinking about World War I, right? He's dealing with the trauma of, of suddenly our highly mechanized modern world is falling apart and, and good, goodness knows when, 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 when you know, these, these horrible machines we've invented are, are, are going to cease butchering people. Right? It's, just, it's just horrible, right? We're not on horses anymore char charging people with pikes. We're, we've, got, we've got far, far more dangerous machines now, right? So we're, World War I must have been absolutely right. Um, and so this, this idea now, now this is where, where spiritualism would, would be more about a journey and identity would, I think, be a lot more uh, about different facets of being which are pulled out and and maybe aren't pulled back together um coherently in the end of it right um it, 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 it's uh and that's again what we would say is the electric and environment also makes a change constantly because we're, we're not as fixed in our identity any anymore be, because we have so many different role models uh, and uh, you know things uh you know pulling us this way and that and we're spread across the whole world and it's hard to be a consistent person when the landscape is is so broad or so changing or or, or so diverse etc cetera, etc cetera. yeah yeah that was beautiful and i love bringing up poetry t.s Eliot said that poetry is outing your inner dialogue so that's sort of like that thing maybe your soul or your psyche how do you get that out of you? You know, I ask people, what language is your inner dialogue in? You know, and sometimes they go English and I go, well, they go TV commercials or my mother <laughs> complaining or, you know, various. Things. That's what their their inner dialogue is. And one of my favorite answers was the experimental filmmaker Abigail Childlast 
you're in New York. She goes, I says, what language is your inner dialogue in? She goes, I wish I knew. <laughs> I said, that is a beautiful answer. But, you know, we, we're trying to out that, maybe. In, in being artists or musicians or poets or literature, something's going on inside our head or our soul or our psyche. And how do we get that out, you know? So I wanted to pull this to contemporary times because it was so beautiful how you brought up World War I, Sherry, and then Clinton sort of took off on it. But, you know, on January 6th, we had this event happen in D.C. and at the Capitol, and it really had an impact on me because it caused me to pay more attention to the news. And I just got swooped into it. And I've tried to reflect why would I want to know more about this? And why is it? Because I practice anti-war, you know, protesting in the 60s in D.C. I went from Michigan as a teenager on a bus to go protest the war. And so I think nonviolent protest is a valid way to express your feelings. And then if the press goes along. So... I was curious because one person who stood out in the Capitol insurrection was Jacob Chansley's his last name. He claims he's a shaman. He's the guy everybody saw because he wore a bear skin and horns, you know, and he yelled and mm -hmm. he, he called himself a self-initiated shaman. And then some of the press said, well, this is uh, this, you know, this is indigenous culture. This is a diss to indigenous culture. And really what he's doing is what's called cosplay, costume play, C-O-S-P-L-A-Y, which is a word that just came into being in 1993. It's like, mm -hmm. well, we've had costume playing forever, but it's sort of like, <laughs> let's reduce it and make it a more punchy word. And I'm for inventing new words. So uh, then they go deeper into an article and say, if you are a shaman, you don't call yourself a shaman. And some of the Cherokee people say there's only probably three shamans on earth. But I've been using the word shaman for years in studying um, mental dis disability, let's say, because I think some people who are labeled mentally disabled are just shamans. They're just coming from a different, you know, whatever you want to call it, psyche, soul, uh, archetype. They're, they, they have it not, you know, they're not the norm or they're not socially accepted. So, I mean, I would like, to pull, bring in this word shamanism, maybe Sherry, you can talk about it in terms of Jungian or any. What is shamanism? I mean, isn't isn't Joyce and Jung shamans in a way that they're just they're they're doing something? I mean, here's what the word shaman is from: one who knows. I mean, they sort of appear like Jung, sort of a players. I know I have some sort of knowledge and I'm going to say, you, you know, Joyce has definitely got an ego. I know, you know, so um, Sherry, what, what's your take on shamanism? How do you navigate that? Yeah. Beware anyone who calls himself a shaman. <laughs> I, I, uh, uh, you know, before I moved into where I live now, which I'm very happy to be where I am now, but I was in this horrible living situation with housemates, uh, uh, one of whom called herself, I'm a shaman. And she had <laughs> pictures of the ascended oh. masters on the wall in the living room. And then the guy that lived there tried to put a voodoo curse on me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know if it was a curse. He he nailed some 
things onto my door, you know, like scary, like African death mask and, and, and pictures of Aztec sacrifice, bloody pictures of Aztec sacrifice that he nailed onto my bedroom door. So anyway, sorry to. <laughs> oh, that's it. See, here's the, the beauty is spiritual people. <laughs> yeah. No, the beauty is, Sherry, what we want is anecdote and storytelling. And what we're trying to talk about <laughs> is that that puts it in, in, you know, in terms of understanding, I think. That's exactly what we're aspiring to do. But I mean, you said beware of shamanism. But in, in regards to Jung and, and Joyce, how does that word apply? They didn't call yeah. themselves shamans, but did, were they in a way shamanists? Um, well, you know what you were taught when you asked the question, um, uh, about, let's see, oh, violence and the quest for identity. Yeah. Uh, just today I heard a, a, a thing on BBC radio about, they were talking about the myth of Gilgamesh and, um, yeah. so, you know, they were, Gilgamesh and his pal, how do you say his name? do or something like that they're they're out they're they're two young dudes they're out doing violent stuff and they're pals together and it reminded me of the guys at the capitol um you know i i feel sorry for those guys because i feel like they they i want to i would want somebody to sit down with them and say what 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 do you guys need you know like um you want i think People need a quest in their life, especially when you're young. You want to feel like you're working for something good. You're, you've got a purpose. You're doing something in the world, and you're bringing about. You have a good cause, and put them to work. Give them something to do where they. I think that's the problem with te- I I worked as a substitute teacher for the last three years in in high schools. And, and I would think these guys don't need to be sitting in this classroom learning algebra. They need to be out, you know, doing purposeful work. I, I think that's what these guys need. And yeah, the shaman and, and I um, uh, had a boyfriend a few years ago who um, had a lot of uh, mental illness you know, anxiety and things like that. And I used to go to all his psychiatric appointments with him, but his psychiatrist would say, you know, in another culture, you would be a shaman because he, you know, he couldn't really function in in this culture, but but he definitely had the far reaching vision. Um, uh so it's it's all it's it's about valuing like like the inherent um, gifts that other people have and putting a value on that and putting it to good use in the culture so that people feel like like they have a purposeful life. Yeah, that was beautiful, Sherry, because that's a great load to lay on to Clinton right now, Clinton. You really are. You're one of those young dudes and you know, you have a purpose and you've cut, you you have a calling and you really pursue it. How did you get into your psyche and soul to have the courage to do that and not, you know, party down and, and pursue other sort of air heady dude things. <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness. Yes. Um, well, this is exactly, I, I think, why I'm, 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 I'm in this, why I'm in this field, so to speak, is, is exactly because we're dealing with a situation caused by media, um, and and uh, television news and journalism and uh, what and radio news has has been constitutive has has been our sensory extensions. For for 50, 60, 70, 80 years, right? With the, the, the newspaper, 150 years, the telegraph press of uh, this is how we find out about what's happening in in the world. And um, yet, I grew up on the internet, completely different planet from everyone else. I've got a completely different view of 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 um, what it is these cosplayers have been doing for for a very long time. A costume play, and another word for it is LARPing which means yeah. um, live action role playing. 
was it it's like being a civil war reenactor or yeah. uh, or or uh, or going to uh, to a renaissance fair dressed dressed yeah. up in it, right uh, right uh, the idea of role playing right uh, live action role playing as a hobby and a pastime while marsh McLuhan um talked about the the coming of the global theater in the 70s and and, and how everyone um this would be the sort of identities that people would have is they wouldn't have identities they would have roles that they would put on and play right right uh um that that they would get from um you know uh, the media or the television screen right and the, and i think they 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 can be roles which are as profound as archetypal roles i'm sure that there's that that, that um a shaman is qualifies as a jungian archetype figure right in the um i assume so right, right? the wise person who, who who speaks in in codes um right is uh their 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 mind is sort of bringing things together in a strange way but but is this prescient but hard to understand right um to, to put a very long story short the internet has always been a frick place of people questioning and 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 and, and uh, double checking and and uh, fact checking everyone and finding their own facts and and you know if an activist cites a statistic then I'm gonna go and I'm gonna find that original study and, I, and I'm gonna spend an hour reading the original study and I'm gonna make sure that activist isn't just you know abusing numbers and abusing science to you know <laughs> right so it's it's so we've been living, I've been living in the environment of, of the internet, which is conversational and participational and full of people taking it on, on themselves to fact check the media. And uh, so that's where we end up um, eventually getting to lots of people being dispossessed by, by just how much journalists think they know and how well they can explain stuff and we get you know accusations of fake news and we end up with people larping out on the streets to try and save democracy because they they fact checked the election and they know better than what than what all the journalists are saying you know oh you know the, the new york times called it this way oh yeah well i went and i saw the footage of this happening and right every, every, everyone's using the information in, environment to try and hold power to account in their own way and what is power and um and uh, why you want to be uh, on account held to account um this gets to uh, lots of people's heads and they do end up um feeling like they have a cassandra complex because they're, they're screaming out truth and no one's listening to them and they assume they're generally of, of uh being a meme magician or a shaman or something right so that's that's kind of what we've been seeing come come to a head here and i understand it I and so I understand I'm 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 stunned. I understand it all 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 too well on those terms. I, I think it's kind of funny the the idea that 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 um that that dude was what appropriating native culture by in his way of like that, that, that that's a silly com complaint of all the things you could complain about the guy. There's lot there's lots of charges to, to level at him, but appropriating <laughs> native culture is just a little heavy handed right. for crying out loud. <laughs> yeah, That's it a <laughs> yeah, it was a way to, to keep contemporary, but then you know he gets thrown in jail and his mother goes, He has to have organic food or he'll <laughs> die. <laughs> so, anyways, you know, and it just makes like as soon as Biden gets in, all the all the all we see on the news is Bernie with funny little <laughs> gloves. I mean, it's like, can't we? Anyways, this is a great, that, you guys really handled that well. And this is something I'm really fond of from um, the anthropologist Edmund Carpenter. Oh, what a blow that Phantom gave me. He's, he's just one of Marshall's main partners. And I, I turn to this first line in his book constantly, and I'd love to hear your take on it, Sherry and Clinton. Electricity has made angels of us all, not angels in the Sunday school sense of being good and having wings, but spirit freed from flesh, capable of instant transportation anywhere. So, I mean, here's Sherry's in Texas. I'm in Venice, California, and you're in Canada. We're, we're like angels. We're instantly transported anywhere and our spirits are freed from flesh even though it feels like i can feel both of you and touch you and i'm glad you're here when i grew up in catholic schools 
Uh, I had a, a nun that taught me, she says, well, I'm protected by my guardian angel. And I always grew up never, you know, leaving the Catholic church, even though I'm not a practicing Catholic, like most boomers, boomers my age check out when they're like 15 years old. They're, they don't practice Catholicism. There. I never really checked out. So I believe in my guardian angel. And there's a, you know, a guy I will see constantly on the street and I'll go, that's probably my guardian angel. <laughs> but, you know, this whole idea of angels in the way he describes it is pretty funny because he's saying that's what electricity did to us. What's your, uh, what's your take on angels, um, uh, Sherry, in, in, you know, in your sense of Jungian being raised a Catholic and in Blake, you know, how does it like resonate in your life, if, an, if any way at all? Yeah. So was the first word of that quote was, was that first word technology? No, it was electricity has made angels of us oh, all. Electricity. Electricity yeah, has made angels. Not angels in the sunny school sense, but spirit freed from flesh, capable of instant transportation anywhere. It's really an amazing line. But go ahead, Sherry, what's your take? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I, I know, you know, I, for it seems like for the last 10 years or so, so many people are, are always talking about angels and it's become kind of a cliche. And I don't like that, the cliche kind of angel things i i know there have been times like like when i was in that house with those crazy people that i felt were trying to do me harm and i was lying in bed i couldn't sleep and i i asked for angels to protect me and and then i got an image of like these two guys that were warriors you know they were angels but they were warriors and they're like okay ma'am we got this you know and <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't like your ethereal <laughs> feathered although i've seen plenty of those too um i mean i i've had many i guess i would call them mystical experiences of different uh beings some some demons and some angels um and but they're all like different you know i i don't know if either of you know about kerrville it's a it's a folk festival that happens every year in central texas and um hmm. well it's it's people come from all over to it but it's it's out in the hill country and um Richard Thompson was there last year when we uh, went, uh, and you know, so so great folk singers come from all over, and, and people come from all over. But but whenever I'm there, um, I have a sense of huge angelic presences there in that place, and I can't. When I'm there, I can't even like. I, I look around everybody and think, how can these people just be walking around acting like normal people? I, I can't, I, I'm just like sitting there like weeping because I feel this energy. But um, so so you're asking me the question as it relates to Carl Jung? Is that well, you, you, you explained it well because you put it in context of Sherry. But that to me is Jungian because it's like what you said so well, Jungian alchemy. It's like taking this idea of angels, which is so much like a Hallmark card now, and it's so cliche, yeah. and flipping it into an archetype, like McLuhan, from, from cliche to archetype. And you're, it's user's content. You're using it as something powerful. Like, how can these other people not know this? When we have these moments in the Finnegan's Wake Reading Club where it describes exactly what's going on in the world like an I Ching it's like uh, don't other people realize how important this is <laughs> you know you're having like epiphanies but I think it's 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 well what you said we we can just go to Clinton unless you have more but it's sort of like it sounds like a cliche for me to bring up angels but it's it's going to be interesting what 
Glenn says, because he understands how important Carpenter is in McLuhan's world. I mean, Carpenter like almost co-wrote a few of Marshall's books and his mm -hmm. books are like Marshall's. They got all these pictures in them and he's just an amazing, uh, you know, down to earth anthropologist. And that's why mm -hmm. Marshall tapped into him. But to say that line, you know, Clinton, what's your take? The spirit freed from flesh, capable of instant transportation everywhere. You know, that's, go ahead. Yeah, I think one of the most powerful and useful probes that uh, McLuhan and, yes, Ted Carpenter um, um, made was, was regarding a, the discarnate nature of electricity. The, um, the three of us are all here um, in this video conferencing session from miles and miles and miles apart, right? That itself alone is, is, uh, is discarnate as ang is, is, is angelic, um, in a way, which was impossible before, well, the telegraph, but uh, you, you understand, um, that the, the, the television camera or, or, or now the digital camera and, and the, the digital video streaming and all that stuff. Right. Um, and, it doesn't seem much to resonate with the idea of, of, of angels in the sense that you were describing, um, Sherry, um, of, of, of intuiting and feeling, you know, and sensing just the presence or, or, uh, you know, the spirit of a particularly, uh, um, you know, sacred place or, and, and feeling that that's, that sort of, but at the same time, um, those are the sort of um, ways of navigating the electric world intuitively that we need or the ways to, to make sense of, of so much information all the time that wasn't so much true when, when um, be before the, the, the daily newspaper was, pl was plopping the entire planet on your you know, <laughs> doorstep, you know, in the morning version and the evening version, right? Two days two newspapers a day every day the whole planet dropping on your lap um or right uh, uh changed everything uh, you know 150 years ago um be before that you uh um according to mcclone pe people were much more um lo logical and uptight because all they did was read books all day and they had processes and they were like machine clockwork sort of and they they didn't have those sort of spiritual in encounters at a degree such that um such that to to have ecstasies was the sort of I, I guess I I haven't read William James but 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 you know there's this whole idea of trying to awaken ecstatic feelings and and you know um uh, uh, spiritual experiences owing the fact that people were by default very closed off from from those forms of meaning making and and sensing the world right. And and those forms are what have come back now, largely with um, right. The, the world's been largely re-enchanted, I guess you could say. We which which could say that it's it's become more symbolic, um, yeah. it, it more more resonant. Fe fe fewer signs, more symbols nowadays in the electric <laughs> world, right? <laughs> wow, that was you're really pulling us full circle there. Re-enchanting with symbols. That's where we started. Symbols and signs. So we're closing up in about ten minutes and. I wanted to read this little bit, but you know what you just said, um, Clinton really evoked. Marshall said when um, baby boomers like me went to college, we started taking LSD because we didn't have television so much. You know, we were in our dorm rooms with all our friends. And so we took LSD to fill in for our television. And it was like so <laughs> so much active in my dorm in University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, Alice Lloyd, famous dormitory. We would watch Alice in Wonderland by Disney every Friday night and everybody would trip out. And I mean, it was just like, are you reverting to your childhood, you know, Disney? And you know, you're tripping out. So it was this discarnate state, you know, and indeed we are, discarnate but it seems as though to me that all three of us have been so present here in doing something we aspire for in this series is communication 
of the new is a miracle, but it's not impossible. So, you know, I'm going to read this little thing and then I would love for you to, to just sum up if you could tell the world anything about Jung and you could tell the world anything about McLuhan, please do so. But check this. This is a Marshall in 1971. And he said, when the sensory inputs are dim, the sensory response is correspondingly strong. That is why small children are always poetic in their responses correspond in their responses to anything at all a child's mm. sensory reception is very selective somewhat in the manner of what is offered our senses by abstract art and just because the sensory offering is meager the sensory response is full. As we grow older, we dim down the sensory responses and increase the sensory inputs, turning ourselves into robots. That is why art is indispensable for human survival. Art perpetuates, perpetually dislocates our usual sensory responses by offering a very abstract or meager and selective input. So I thought that was beautiful how he brings in what this sort of flow chart of us putting out and us receiving in the sense that, you know, with a child, you know, everything is wow, you know, and uh, I collect children's art that pe parents throw out. And I'm always amazed at like, how do you pick uh, one that's good, <laughs> you know? And I can, go through, I can go through a pile of 20 children's paintings and like go, this one is amazing. Now the kid thinks every one is amazing. They don't have this aesthetic, you know, and it's, it, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing. So, I mean, Sherry, you know, you're studying Jung, and especially the gentleman who, who you uh, uh, read his book, he's quoted a lot. I've been trying to learn about Jung, and it is difficult, and I've been trying to learn about McLuhan, and it is difficult. And that's why I reach out to my friends and see if they can explain it to me, <laughs> you know, and you guys have been good. But if you could tell the world, you know, Marshall had this thing from a poet, Ezra Pound, he says, I'm trying to needle the subnabulism. So we know people are dumbed down is the word or they're shut off and they're like, I just want to run my life and be happy. And that's all good. But if you wanted to enlighten people about young, what would you tell them, Sherry? Why is it important to, to you to study him? And what kind of revelation comes to you in your life personally from it? Yeah, well, I've been, um, like I say, I've been reading this uh, Anatomy of the Psyche with, with a friend, um, and, and, and we also studied it in, in the Young Society, um, and both of us feel like, like it's like getting therapy to, to be reading this book, and it helps us with, with everything we're dealing with in our lives constantly, and it relates, it's, it's relates so much to to, to Joyce and to Finnegan's Wake, and it helps me understand that. It helps my writing. Um, but I, I did what, what was coming up for me while you were talking, and this, sorry if it's, this isn't exactly young, but it fits in with what you're saying about children and art and all that. When um, I remember one evening when my older son was seven years old, um, he, uh, we were taking a walk in the evening, and we'd walk down to the park and we were walking back. And so it was just starting to get dark. And I said, I said, oh, Chris, can you hear the crickets? And because uh, you could hear the crickets really loud. And then he said, he's only seven. He said, when I was little, I didn't know that that was crickets. When I would hear that, he said, I thought that 
when it started getting dark that the planets and the stars moved in closer to the earth and that that was the sound that they made. So, yeah. That is beautiful. Yeah, that is really beautiful. And so it, it's definitely raised your awareness studying Jung and, and, and being able to suss out. I think therapy is a great thing because I know playing music, riding my bike, that's all therapy for me. But you could just say, hey, that's casual living and that's just going about your life. But it, it can apply to your mental and your spiritual self, you know. So, Clinton, if you could tell the world, why, why do you study McLuhan? What does it do for you personally? He just has an entirely different history of, uh, of the West than everyone else. He, 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 he doesn't go through philosophy. He goes through art. And he goes through... He doesn't go through what is written in books and what the ideas are in the books or, or what speeches were made or what sermons were made or, 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 you know, well, he, he, he doesn't care so much what, 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 um, what Cicero said, but how Cicero said what he said, how he was rhetorical or how much, rhetoric is in this book compared to how logical is this book is, is is this book missing the point by being too logical right so he's reading books not for their content but for how how the person uses words because he just he he got that from from studying so much poetry right it, words weren't merely things that you said in prose or then if you make it rhyme now it, it's a poem right uh, um he studied um, the style of language to such a ridiculous degree that he then took it upon himself to go read so much historical literature and go analyze, the, you know, the way people thought based on how they used words and how that changed over decades and centuries, especially through the, the Catholic Church and whatnot. So, so then when he's looking around at our contemporary world, he's he's not drawing on, you know. Um, um, Descartes did this, and then Hegel said that, and because Kant did this, and then Nietzsche came along, and now and now Freud says this. The end, right? He's not building on that on that uh, stack of of history that everyone else who, who you know took philosophy in 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 school is standing on. So he's just got this this crazy out there view on stuff that that is just it seems to come from an, another planet because he's he's kind of living in his own separate timeline for for having lived in a in the library at Cambridge for so long, digging through all this stuff, de developing his doctoral thesis in the early forties. So that's that's why I go back to McLuhan because he's always coming that stuff from just a wild angle, and it takes so long just to even you know try to figure out where he's coming from. <laughs> so but it's a it's been rewarding it's 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 been rewarding to, to try to try and put myself in where as best as i i can figure you know his head space or, or or his perception would 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 try to come from as a, as a means of looking around at the world today even yeah that that was really well put because it reminded me of henry gibson on a tv show uh, that i used to watch called laugh in and he'd go what you doing, Marsha McLuhan? <laughs> you know <laughs> how short of a how short of a poem you can do on a national comedy TV show in America and drop McLuhan's name. And so, in closing, I want to thank you both. And it's been amazing because we um, started. Um, someone brought up, I think Sherry and and uh, Clinton. You sort of reiterated it. I have this question that goes. Is uh, human progress cumulative or cyclical? Are we just going in circles or are we getting better or getting worse? And it is sort of like a cone that sort of goes up and we're going in circles and it's circulating up and then maybe it circulates down, but we're constantly in this cone shape. So it, uh, it just makes me want to plan another seed where we could possibly meet sometime in the future on one of these McLuhan mashups mm -hmm. and discuss this because um, I thought it would be fun because the crossover is beautiful with Sherry is that Marshall did a lot of his pun making. He's a pandemic 
you know, uh, <laughs> in his joke making, in his aphorisms, because of Finnegan's Wake, you know, and so mm -hmm. we have this commonality. And Marshall's called Finnegan's Wake an intellectual black mass. And, you know, the black mass sounds, ooh, that's devil. But it really is a way to mock the Catholic mass and its satire. And it's based a lot in the study of something I know, Sherry, you've studied too, is Fraser's Golden Bough from 1890, which is something that's important that we can you know, contemplate more in the future. So again, thank you guys both for being in McLuhan Mashup. Thank you. Thank you. It was so much fun. It was